Hey everybody, welcome back to Bamboo Batu. This is Fred, and we're talking about bamboo in Europe today. Uh, I've got a lot to say about this topic. It's a real interesting one. If you want to know more about it, definitely check out the website. Most of what I'm going to talk about, there's articles on the website covering all these different specific topics that we're going to touch upon, and including one specifically about bamboo farming in Europe. There's one about bamboo gardening in Europe, uh, a couple different ones there, and then uh, a lot of the uh, kind of subtopics that we're going to touch upon. So check that out. And uh, of course, uh, if you'd be so kind as to like and subscribe, and if you got something to chime in, let us know down in the comments. We always love to hear from you. So let's get into it. We're talking about bamboo cultivation and farming and gardening in Europe. Um, yeah, a lot of interest in this topic recently. Here's uh, some bamboo. Uh, if you look at that, the first thing you think of is probably not Europe. Uh, bamboo is generally not a European plant. Uh, of all the 1,600 or so species of bamboo, none of them are native to Europe. It's the only continent uh, without any native bamboo, uh, except for Antarctica, of course, which we don't really count usually, seeing how it's uninhabited. But uh, North America, South America, Asia, Africa, Australia all have native bamboo species. Europe does not. So growing bamboo there is uh, not the first uh, not the first place you would go to grow bamboo. But if you live there in Europe already and you want to grow bamboo, it makes sense. But uh, yeah, that picture looks a lot more like this area. Uh, I'm not sure where that picture of the Buddha was. Could have been taken in Belgium for all I know. I don't remember where it came from, but it definitely had the look of an Asian situation. And indeed, most bamboo is native to China, India, Southeast Asia, this part of the world. Uh, lots of bamboo actually comes from South America as well. And then there's a handful of species native to Australia and North America and Africa. But the vast, vast majority of bamboo is coming from, from Asia, which is why we usually associate bamboo with Asia, but bamboo does grow well in many parts of the world, just about everywhere, uh, with all the different species to choose from. You can pretty much cover the globe, um, which is why we're now talking about species selection. So the first thing you gotta figure out if you wanna grow bamboo in any location is which species you're gonna grow. So certain species grow better in certain climates, in certain soil types, um, they need, Certain temperatures, they need certain precipitation. Some of them don't like it to get too hot. Uh, a lot of them don't like it to get too cold. Uh, irrigation or precipitation is generally important, but there are drought tolerant species as well. So looking at Europe, we're looking at a relatively colder climate. So we're looking at cold hardy bamboos generally. Um, you also need to think besides the climate and the location, you got to think about what you want to grow the bamboo for. What is the ultimate end use of the bamboo? Do you just want it to look pretty in your garden uh, as an ornamental or are you growing it for some commercial purpose? And if so, which commercial purpose? There's hundreds of products you can make from bamboo. And a lot of people just start planting bamboo saying, I'm going to make money on bamboo because you can make hundreds, hundreds and thousands of different things out of it. And then you ask him, well, which products are you planning on making? So I don't make, make any of them, which is not a great strategy. If, uh, if you want to make any thing from bamboo, there's probably a specific species that's going to be, or a handful of species that are going to be better suited for whatever that end of product might be, whether it's bamboo shoots, bamboo furniture, uh, bamboo paper, um, building material, whatever it's going to be, uh, you need to figure that out. And again, if you're just growing it for ornamental purposes, then then you're looking at more of the uh, the size and the appearance of the bamboo, how it's going to look uh, situated with your other plants and landscaping and, and features around your property. So species selection is crucial. Uh, definitely some regional considerations uh, to take into account when you're selecting a bamboo species in Europe. Uh, anywhere in Northern Europe, say France or, or North, of that uh, where it's gonna freeze frequently, you're gonna need a cold hardy uh, bamboo variety. So anything in the Phyllostachys genus is gonna be a good choice. Uh, Pseudosasa is another one. Pseudosasa japonica 
uh, also known as arrow bamboo. That one's really commonly grown in Europe. Uh, but the phyllostachys are, are the most common. They're they're prolific. They spread they spread quite a bit. So if you're worried about running bamboos, then you might want to think about phargasias. Phargasias are really popular in Europe as well. They're clumping. They're smaller. They're ornamental, uh, but they can tolerate freezing temperatures, which is uh, unusual for a clumping bamboo. Usually, usually the clumpers are going to be more tropical or subtropical. So if you're in, say, Spain or Italy, Portugal, Greece, down in Southern Europe, then the, uh, the clumpers like bamboo, so would be a good choice. Uh, they do grow a lot of phyllostachys down there as well. Phyllostachys can handle hot temperatures, cold temperatures. Uh, depends a little bit on the species. There are about 50 or 60 or 75. I don't remember exactly how many species of phyllostachys out there, but there's a lot. So there's definitely some variations. Uh, again, depending on what the purpose of, of growing bamboo is, uh, that's going to dictate what you choose. But as far as climate goes, uh, obviously, the further north you go, the colder it's going to get. You're going to need something really cold hardy. And uh, most of the phyllostachys would fit the bill there, as well as the phargasias. And down south, uh, the phyllostachys still work well, as well as other running bamboo varieties. And you can get into some of the clumpers, uh, like the bambusas, for example. Again, there's about 100 species of bambusa. Uh, some of them are really tropical. Some of them are more subtropical. So the, you're not really going to be growing the, the real heavy-duty tropicals uh, in Europe. So the dendrocalamus, the gigantocloas, the guaduas, not going to do very well. You can, you can get away with it here and there uh, if you find a really hot spot. Seville, Spain, for example, um, maybe Crete, uh, Southern Greece. Uh, but in general, they're not gonna, they're not gonna perform their best. They're not gonna perform the way they would in, in Indonesia or you know, Thailand or India or something like that. So yeah, as far as cold hardy bamboos, this is actually a Fargesia, Fargesia Muriele, I believe this is in Sweden. So pretty cold really cold, really dark in the winter. Um, not ideal for bamboo, but this one is, is uh, hanging in there. This is in Stockholm in the botanical gardens. I took this picture a couple years ago. Uh, if you look closely, you can see that it's actually flowering, which is pretty interesting and exciting. Bamboo doesn't flower all that often. I don't remember the flowering period on this species, but it was still pretty special to see it in flowering. The fact that it's flowering also makes me think maybe it's a stress response because of the cold weather and the long nights, long hours of darkness through the winter, uh, followed by very long days, um, uh, lots of daylight <coughs> hours in the summer. So that radical shift from those super long days to the super long nights <coughs> and the cold temperatures might be causing some stress on this bamboo. It's not, it's not normal conditions for the Fargasia. These are native to the foothills of the Himalayas in Asia. So northern India, southern China, uh, Nepal, Bhutan, that area. So not really used to those extreme um, long days, short nights and short days and long nights that you get in, in Sweden. So that could be a stress response. But otherwise, it's a very popular species throughout Europe. Uh, you see it a lot in Germany, um, in France for sure because it is a clumper which means it's not going to be spreading and it's super cold hardy it'll handle down to minus 10 or 20 um i believe minus 10 or 20 fahrenheit which is pretty similar actually when you go into celsius something like minus 20 celsius um there's a oh, there i'll put links down below like i said to all the articles about the different species so there's a there's a big long one about fargasius uh, but real interesting class of, of bamboo, genus of bamboo, technically. Um, so yeah, it's a good good choice for ornamental purposes in the cold climates. If you don't want a, a runner that might that might start spreading and taking over. Um, what else we have? We have d d d ornamental bamboo was the next topic. Yes. Um, so yeah, if you're looking into ornamental bamboo, there's lots of choices for Europe. This is a picture in. Paris, France. This is a Japanese garden uh, that I stumbled across. 
had like five or six different species of bamboo right here. So that's Phyllostachys uh, ario sulcata in the front left. Uh, there's nice yellow poles. Uh, they got a little bit of striping on there. Really pretty, really nice ornamental. Um, I forget what all the other species are in there. I think that's, uh, uh, I've got notes on it somewhere. But uh, off the top of my head, I don't, I don't recall the different species in there. But the point is you can grow lots of uh, running bamboo, um, the short ones. Uh, the ornamental ones, the ones with the slender poles. These are not going to be good commercial farming bamboos generally, but real nice uh, decorative. There was you know, there was some black bamboo in the garden here. Um, uh, I think there's some indicalamus there. Um, yeah, lots of choices of bamboo species. Now, if you're growing it for commercial purposes, for let's say building material, then you're going to be want you're going to want to be growing the Timber species again, Phyllostachys is going to be the most suitable for a timber species in Europe. This is Vivax, I believe. Phyllostachys Vivax, um, the golden version. And in some parts of Europe, you can grow Moso. Everybody's always talking about Moso because Moso is such a big deal in China. But when you take it out of China, it does not grow so well. Although I have seen some nice groves in Europe. But they take a long time to get established. Uh, I was told by the guys at Bamboo Logic in the Netherlands, a big uh, bamboo supplier for farmers, bamboo farms. They say that it's kind of roughly at Paris, that um, latitude um, is about as far north as you want to get for, um, for Moso, anything north of that. Is going to be too cold for Moso. So Paris and South could be could work for Moso, but it's a real slow one to get established. There's lots of other timber bamboos that are that are faster growing. Phyllostachys viridis, for example, is a really good one. Uh, Madake Phyllostachys bambusoides is pretty good. Uh, Henon is really good, but Henon's been flowering the last couple of years, so kind of want to wait for the flowering to end before you plant any any Henon. Uh, Phyllostachys nigra, Henonis. Um, so yeah, lots of choices there. Again, really kind of depends on your specific product you're thinking of making if you're talking about growing commercially and growing commercial bamboo in Europe. Keep in mind, if you're going to be growing bamboo to, to make products, you're probably going to compete with Chinese products, even though they're coming from around the world, they still are super efficient and produce a lot of bamboo that goes everywhere. And in the climate in Europe, the bamboo is probably not going to grow as fast as it does in China or other tropical places. So it is a bit difficult to be competitive. So it's really important to find some kind of niche product that isn't already uh, being imported from China or Asia and hasn't already saturated the European markets. So finding something new, uh, we can touch on that a little bit later. Um, you might consider building a factory. Uh, to process your bamboo, there are currently not any significant bamboo factories in Europe, which is a little bit discouraging. If you want to grow bamboo for commercial purposes, there's not a lot of factories, or there are not any factories who will buy your bamboo in order to convert it into bamboo boards and panels and flooring, for example, like you see in this in this photo here. So, this we always refer to as a uh, chicken and egg dilemma. There's a chicken. And there's the egg and which one is going to come first the bamboo farm or the bamboo factory you can't really build a factory unless you have bamboo available there to put into the factory and you're not going to be really confident about planting a farm unless the factory is there to buy your bamboo so it's a bit of a dilemma there at the same time you're looking at this <clears throat> bamboo shipping around the world uh with a significant carbon footprint and also just sending our money to other parts of the world when we could be supporting local economies, creating local jobs and reducing that transportation. Uh, it's a really good argument for, for growing bamboo in Europe. If you're, if you're European and you want to support local industry, local jobs, local economy, uh, there's a strong argument to be made for producing bamboo locally as there are so many uses and increasingly high demand for bamboo products. It does make sense, but it keeps coming back to that chicken and egg dilemma of who's going to build a factory, 
and who's going to plant the farms. And if you plant the bamboo today, you're not really going to be ready to harvest it for the factory for about six or seven or eight years. So that's also uh, creates some, some uncertainty. But in my mind, I think if you plant it today, six or seven or eight years from now, there will be factories. Um, but of course there's no guarantee of that, but, uh, why not, uh, why not get a head start, start planting now. Um, but at the same time, consider different products you can make. So in the absence of big bamboo factories, that'll take your products, uh, bamboo poles are the first thing that people think of, uh, bamboo poles are great. You can build with them. You can make, um, uh, bird feeders, you can make bird houses, you can make coffee tables. You can make curtain rods. You can make a lot of things with bamboo poles. Uh, you can build a gazebos, but the demand for gazebos is only uh, you know so much in Europe. There's a handful of people that want to build a bamboo gazebo, and so if you're talking about planting hundreds of uh, hectares of bamboo, you're going to need to come up with something else. Also, shipping poles is a real hassle because you fill up a container or the back of a truck with all these bamboo poles and you're shipping mostly air. These are big, long, hollow tubes as what bamboo, uh, bamboo poles are. And that's a little bit tricky, uh, for shipping kind of expensive, not real efficient. So in the middle picture here, we have bamboo slats, the bamboo slats make a lot more sense. Uh, you strip them down, you do a little bit of pre-processing. Now you have a product where you've added some value to it. You don't have these hollow tubes. Uh, you can fill up a truck and have it filled all the way to the top without, um, all this empty space in there. And so that's a great idea if you have a place to ship those, uh, slats to. So still kind of counting on someone else to build a factory, to turn those slats into more highly engineered, high value products like bamboo uh, boards and panels and, and flooring. But in order to make the slats, you can do that with a very simple, pretty pretty inexpensive uh kind of pre-processing factory so that's definitely an interesting angle uh if you want to if you have large volumes of, of big timber bamboo and you want to turn it into something but you're not ready to spend three four or five million dollars on a or euros on a uh on a bamboo processing factory something you might try uh other products you could be making uh, charcoal uh, although European made charcoal, it's going to probably be difficult to compete with imported charcoal, but charcoal is a simple thing to make and it's a straightforward thing to sell. People know what charcoal is. People know how to use it. Um, if you have small amounts of it, you can just sell it locally at the hardware store. People can put it in their barbecue. Uh, so the quantities you have also is going to, uh, dictate somewhat what kind of products you make and what kind of markets you need to be able to reach with that product. <coughs> bamboo shoots uh, there at the end are actually the most popular bamboo product for bamboo farmers in North America. Um, North America has a similar issue of a lot of people want to grow bamboo. There are parts of the U.S. where bamboo grows really well, but there are really no big factories turning bamboo into anything really processed or engineered. So uh, bamboo shoots are the product that most bamboo growers uh, turn to, uh, to, to monetize their, their harvest. Bamboo shoots are pretty easy to harvest. They need to be harvested in a timely manner and sold fresh, but those fresh shoots, there's a really high demand for the fresh shoots, uh, Asian markets and exotic, um, uh, produce dealers. They drive around Florida and, and the Southern States and they, uh, they really love the bamboo shoots. The market for this is surprisingly huge. And so that's definitely something to tap into. Um, it's also smart if you can turn those shoots into something else, add a little bit more value to it, uh, remove that time sensitive issue of having to harvest it and sell it within a couple days of harvest. Uh, but if you're making a product out of it yourself, like, um, bamboo kind of sauerkraut, bamboo chutney, bamboo, uh, there's all kinds of ways you can prepare bamboo. We've got some videos on how to make some different bamboo shoot products, but there's uh, there's also a, a great company down in uh, Australia, Big Heart Bamboo, I think they're called. They make some really cool, creative uh, bamboo culinary products. 
Um, and so that's a, that's a really smart way to go. You don't need a massive factory. Um, you can harvest the stuff pretty easily, process it very easily. Um, so definitely worth looking into all of the phylostachys species of bamboo are edible. Um, so the ones that you're going to grow in Europe, probably going to be edible. And so that's also something to look into, make sure that you're planting appropriate species for, for eating. Um, just going back to the importance of species selection. So lots of different things you can do with your bamboo, lots of ways to prepare it. Um, it really just depends kind of what you're into, what the local market is interested in and kind of finding the intersection between where's the demand and where's your interest and then producing something that makes everybody happy from uh, the bamboo species that, that works well for that product and grows well in your climate. So that's how that works. Uh, something else people are really interested in is carbon credits. People are talking about carbon credits all day long. Um, in my regular day job, I do talk about carbon credits all day long. It's really interesting. It's a little bit confusing. Uh, this background picture I selected on purpose because the, the bamboo is growing in all different directions, which is a little bit how the carbon market feels. It feels like a lot of things going in a lot of different directions and you, you don't know what's going to happen next. That is Phyllostachys dulcis in the background, by the way, the sweet, sweet bamboo, really good one for eating. Um, but not to get distracted by the nice bamboo photographs. This is a diagram of CO2 coming out of the atmosphere, getting sucked into the bamboo. And through the process of photosynthesis, that CO2 is separated into carbon. Carbon stays in the soil, in the roots, in the biomass of the bamboo. And the O2, oxygen, gets released back into the atmosphere where humans and animals can breathe it. And so super important process and very valuable for addressing climate change issues. Uh, the overabundance of CO2 in the atmosphere at the moment. Um, bamboo is great for that. And so a lot of different people and different types of projects are tapping into this carbon credit market, which essentially pays people to operate these different types of projects that are climate positive, that are removing carbon from the atmosphere and storing it long-term somewhere. However, uh, measuring the and quantifying how much carbon you are removing and how much of it you're storing and for how long you're storing it becomes very difficult. So there are a handful of well-respected, well-recognized methodologies that um, you can follow those guidelines to generate uh, valuable carbon credits that will be respected and valued on the market. And then there's other methodologies that really not respected and not understood and not recognized. And if you generate those credits, you might have a really hard time selling the credits. So it's a really tricky business. Um, I could spend another hour or several going into that topic, but just to touch on it lightly, there is a standard called ANCRA, O-N-C-R-A. They are based in the Netherlands and they are helping some bamboo growers in Europe to generate carbon credits. The guidelines are fairly strict. You do have to follow a certain protocol. Um, it really only works with timber, phylostachys species, a handful of species, including Moso. I don't remember the other couple, two or three. And I think it is also necessary to work with Bamboo Logic, the company in the Netherlands that sells bamboo for planting for uh for large-scale farms and cultivation and using them as a as your cultivation and, and farm management partner to to get those credits all validated and ensure that you're following the protocols correctly so it's a tricky thing if you want to get creative and do different species of bamboo or intercrop your bamboo with something else it becomes very impractical and you're not able to follow those guidelines so some of the best use cases include the intercropping and different species. And so, um, yeah, so it's tough to get the carbon credits basically. Um, but yeah, I mentioned bamboo logic. Also wanted to mention, uh, bamboo park. If you're in Southern Europe, bamboo park is great. They're in Portugal. They provide bamboo plants, uh, ornamental 
and commercial for for growers across Portugal, Spain, France, uh, anywhere in Europe. They'll deliver and help with the setup installation of your bamboo. And Bamboo Logic in the Netherlands has a similar operation, uh, serving more of Northern Europe, um, including the uh, ne- Netherlands, Luxembourg, Belgium. Not sure how much bamboo there is in, in Luxembourg, but that would be an interesting one to look into. Uh, France and Germany. Um, bamboo is also taken off in Italy and Greece. There's a lot going on there. Um, you can order the bamboo from either one of those those suppliers, uh, whichever one you prefer. I don't want to play favorites in this video, but if you call me, uh, set up an appointment, we can talk about carbon credits. We can talk about species selection. We can talk about all manner of bamboo products, processing value chains. I love talking about bamboo and I'd love to hear from you. So I hope you enjoyed this video, found it useful, informative, and hope it'll get you started on growing some bamboo on your farm or in your garden or wherever it might be. And do check out the links down below to the specific articles on species and and, uh, different locations and bamboo types. And appreciate your watching. Like, subscribe, tell a friend, and we'll see you next time.